We're going to have a perspective on, uh, on microwave, uh, long distance wireless, uh, from uh, uh, Stefan Tuch, who is the CEO of uh, McKay Brothers, one of the leaders in this space. Um, and we're also uh, grateful to McKay for uh, sponsoring the reception afterwards. So please join us afterwards for, for a beer uh, with Stefan and, and the rest of us. Thank you. And uh, it's really special for me to be here because the first time I spoke publicly was at the Stack Conference in London. And it was only two years ago. And it was a time of uh, a little bit of stink oil and a lot of, well, is that a flash in the pan kind of thing? And now I want to convince you how far we've moved and how good we've been about shaking off the snake oil and uh, coming out clean. So two years ago, I recall one of the gentlemen in the panel actually asking the question, being asked the question, how far can a microwave go? I don't know if you remember that. And uh, the guy, uh, who will remain unnamed, said, can't go further than 50 kilometers. And I was looking in the audience, and you know everyone took it face value. And, and I was so obviously wrong which it told you about the degree of misunderstanding of the field at the time. And today, of course, I can see you. Everybody's shocked by this. Who is shocked? Hey, good, a few. All right, so it has changed. And the understanding of microwave has completely changed. The industry now is, in some ways, maturing. It's not mature yet, but it's maturing. So who are we there? And I did promise Pete that, I would, that this would not be a sales pitch. So it's, it, but I still have to say who we are. Uh, so we are um, a company formed about three years ago. We opened service about two years ago. And uh, today, I think we're the um, biggest player in this field, biggest player offering a service. There are many other firms that have built their own networks and have great networks too. So the, the competition is very, very, very ferocious. But we're out there and trying. What we do is we have uh, Chicago local. We have Chicago to New Jersey. You can see this extensive little things here. There are dots for Mawa. That's because I assembled the presentation having lost it yesterday, and uh, the dots are actually not dots anymore. We open service to Mawa, uh, the green ones. And Europe uh, shouldn't be dots anymore, too. At least one of the links. All right, so now reflecting on the industry, you know, why are we doing this? Who needs this? Uh, and, and where do we need it? Do we need it everywhere? Uh, are those only for specialized links and specialized needs? And who is using it today? And, and does it matter if everyone has access? And you know, what are the competitive implications of this? Because the bandwidth is fairly scarce. And finally, I'll say a word about the right technology. And that's the crystal ball thing. So let's start with trying to show the equity volumes in the world. So people that need this are essentially the population of people that co-locate at the exchange and whose trading necessitates the data from other exchanges. So if you do trading that is only informed by what happens on one exchange, you don't need microwave within the exchange. So the guys that need that are really people that co-locate because they're interested in speed, and people that uh, do correlated trading. So when I say interested in speed, does anyone who co-locates and does correlated trading uh, need this? And the answer is obviously yes, because the difference in speed of transmission of microwave versus fiber is you know, milliseconds. And nobody here with a self-respecting trading algorithm is going to say he spends more than 
one millisecond doing a decision loop. So really anybody needs this. So has everybody adopted it? Not yet. But it's, it's going very fast. Now, on the same uh, picture, I've put also the, the, the futures volume, just for the equities. And, and the, uh, the scale is, is normalized so that the biggest dots are Chicago and New York, and the rest is scaled down. But it's not scaled down so as to um, render it invisible. It has some added uh, you know, little constant so as not to uh, offend anyone. <laughs> so you can see here that uh, obviously the big link of importance is between Chicago and New York. You can read it from the, the map. But there are other links that matter. And in particular in Europe, there's definitely a link between London and Frankfurt and some other ones. And Asia, Asia is slightly different because if you look at Tokyo, for instance, the two circles are right on top of each other and there's less of a transport issue there. And if you look at China, it's a little bit the same. Korea is different. Korea is a real you know, futures versus equity uh, play. <coughs> now, let's talk about what exists today or is you know, probably going to exist soon. And we've tried to make the, uh, the links uh, proportional not to the bandwidth, but proportional to the number of links and, and somehow proportional to the competitors. So, so you can see that the Chicago to New Jersey link is the thicker line. It has many, many competitors. And there are those bizarre links going to Washington, D.C. or going from, coming from Washington, D.C. Each of those links have roughly four different lines. And uh, those lines, I, you know, there was a comment about uh, some networks being used not fully. It's probably used, I don't know, I want to say 0.01% uh, of the time or less, because it's just used to transmit few pieces of data when they happen to be necessary for trading. And uh, you see that the other big thing that is connected today is London to Frankfurt. Now, there are many putative links. And, uh, and what's fun about this industry is that it's a whole game. Like, people lie about what they're going to build. And, and the people in the uh, fiber world have done that for years. And the people in the microwave world are trying to do that, but it's harder to do because in microwave, you have to file it for your frequencies, so you're kind of exposed as you build. Whereas for fiber, spread was able to you know, pull a great build without almost anyone noticing it. So amongst the links that are of great interest is the one transatlantic that uh, Hibernia has announced for a long time and sounds to be building now. And, uh, this, you can see a little other link going to Lens End, and that's the microwave link. And that's all the thing that's fun about this industry. People that built to Lens End will not be the fastest next year if Hibernia actually delivers what they say they deliver, and this link will be just useless. So it's, it, there's a lot of gaming in this industry. Now, if I focus on the Chicago to New Jersey route, you have an example of the competition there. Uh, the green line is our uh, line. It looks pretty straight, but you know. Um, now, let's look at London. So London is interesting. This, there's actually one missing link here, which I had added on my other presentation. I'm sorry. It's the um, LD4 to Frankfurt. But you can see that uh, there are many links going to Baseldon today, and fewer going to LD4, which I haven't represented, but, uh, and, and there are few links intra-London. But they're getting built, and this is an obvious one. You can see two lines going uh, west. One is actually going to Breen, the future landing station of Hibernia. Maybe Hibernia will allow people there, maybe not. Uh, but some people have already reserved frequency to go there. 
And the fun thing is that you can actually look at all the reservations. And that's the good thing about the uh, microwave industry. There's a lot of transparency about it. So you, you can see which paths are being filed. Built is different, you have to go, but it's above ground. So you can go and take pictures and, and see if the antennas are around. So the, the, you can actually scout the whole thing, and it's very good. Now, New Jersey Metro, uh, if you look at the thickness, it's funny that the big thick line actually goes mostly to NY4, which in terms of equity trading is, is actually smaller. Uh, and there's slightly less going to um, NASDAQ, which is the bigger uh, equity volume, and yet less going to MAWA. So the reason there are fewer guys going to MAWA is a topographical reason. Think of it, you know, it's because of the bizarre nature of that uh, place and the fact that there are many uh, rich people living around it, saying not in my backyard, so it's kind of hard to go and, and build there. But the New Jersey Metro, if you look at it from a, uh, <laughs> from a frequency reservation point of view, has a lot of interest. Uh, it generates a lot of interest, and our prediction is that New Jersey Metro and Metro in general will be even more competitive than long haul builds because it's not as hard to build as, as long haul. And, uh, and the technology is evolving rapidly and improving rapidly there. So now let's go back to the questions. Y you have, and, and by the way, I, I should have said that, but I would love to be interrupted. I would hate to go to the end and have Pete say, questions anyone and nobody asking questions. So if that happens, someone will be pointed out and will have to ask a question. I'm just telling you now, you know, so that you be prepared. Uh, so does it matter uh, if everyone does not have access to it? Because the bandwidth is pretty scarce. And I would argue that no, in most cases, because there is extremely fierce competition and uh, we provide a service and there are other firms providing a service. So as long as there are sufficiently many firms having access to this, all the juice in the ARB is actually being competed almost away to the point where it, you know, those firms make a living, but they don't make an outrageous living. And that's pretty much where we are. Let me go to a little discussion on the components of latency. So what's interesting is, if I go back to the slide, which I won't, but uh, uh, between Chicago and New York, you can see that some of the paths don't look very direct. Some of the paths are actually very wavy, uh, and some have big indirectness. Now, the paths with big indirectness are presumably not worth much anymore. And, and there's a, a big difference in the trading firms. Some of them wanted to get out something super quick uh, to be able to be first there and, and uh, enjoy the advantage for a while while it lasted. And some others were trying to build the best one and were kind of optimizing based on what they saw from the filing of the competition. And uh, some of them are still working at it. Now, in terms of indirectness, any self-respecting path has to have less than 1% of indirectness. And the best paths will have quite a, you know, quite a bit less than that. Now, another uh, component of latency is the signal processing part. So the modulation, demodulation, and the repeat. And essentially repeat is when you get a signal onto a tower, you have to do something and, and to send it back amplified on the other side. And either you do that something in an analog way and the latency is in the few hundred nanoseconds, maybe a hundred nanosecond. There are, there's always filter-induced latencies. Or you have to do some numerical regeneration of the signal. And numerical regeneration used to be fairly large uh, it's come down a lot, and it all depends on whether you need to do 
some uh, error correction which needs store and forward and, and that really kills you or you're just doing on the fly cut through symbol regeneration, symbol cleaning and that can be extremely fast. Now something that will remain uh, but will get better and better is the serialization induced latency. So serialization induced is due to the small bandwidth and typically the bandwidth on long haul microwave is around 100 to 150 megabits per second. So for serialization, the microwave industry has already put a lot of effort into uh, having higher modulations and, and, and pushing the envelope on the modulation side at the frequencies which are between you know, say six and up to 20 and something gigahertz. So there isn't a ton that you can do there. Now, you can play with packet size and, and reduce the packet size if you want, and that shaves a little bit of the serialization latency. But really for the long haul, uh, there is not a ton of progress to be expected there, in my humble opinion, of course. On the local, uh, the bandwidth is actually something that can increase today because the first bandwidth, the first modulation schemes on the local builds were you know, fairly robust. And by robust, you, you mean something where the data per bit, uh, the, the bit per second or sorry, bit per hertz uh, figure of merit isn't very good. Now, this can be increased and, and will presumably be increased while preserving low latency. So you, you can expect some decrease in serialization latency there. Now, there's a whole game about endpoint collocation setup. And, and that's, a, you know, that's a completely data center dependent game. And that is something that is, it's an ongoing process. It gets reduced all the time. Uh, we had uh, a discussion during the coffee break. Holocore fiber is a probable uh, component of that. I don't know when exactly, but it's, it's bound to happen uh, because there's still some significant latency to be uh, cut there. And also, there's also the miscellaneous series, which everyone now is looking at. And then the miscellaneous series is the cable lengths in the towers. You know, mind you, if, if you're at the top of the tower, if your repeater is down here, you know, you have cable going down, cable going up, and that adds up. So we're at that stage where we're trying to remove everything. And, and when I say we, I mean we as an industry, not we as McKay Brothers, or just not we as McKay Brothers only, sorry. So now, how do you look at that figure of merit of, of uh, the latency, the average latency uh, that you need to repeat the signal? So this is a graph that we have been doing for now a year and a half. And on the x-axis, you have some, a figure of merit, which is the average repeat latency. On the y-axis, you have the um, round-trip latency between the CME and Carret. And each of, the, um, each of the lines is one network. And the slope of the line is the number of the towers in the network. And the intercept of the line on the y-axis is the air length of the network. So that, that's, that's the place where it gets a little commercial because we happen to be a little better than the others. Um, we, we, we have a fairly, uh, not too steep, so we have fewer towers on average, and we come out with a, you know, a, f a fairly aggressive and pretty close to uh, ideal path length on the air. Now, if you look at the blue dot, blue dot was June, the latencies of June uh, 2013. And it was the latency on, on McKay, it was the latency on um, Strike, and uh, the latency on the web uh, side of, um, 
of, uh, please help me, uh, Absalon. So, and, and, and the one on the uh, website of Absalon, I think is stacked, uh, stacked on, uh, behind the, the blue one. Uh, the blue and the red are stacked on top of, it, of each other. Um, so the dots in red are the ones uh, from June of last year, and the dot in, in yellow is where we announced we would be at the end of this year. So if you read this, and that you know uh, averages out all the components of latency before, like the repeat one, uh, the regeneration at some of the sites, the endpoint latency, the, the fiber tails and everything, and the miscellaneous cabling. This thing is really rapidly going down to zero, uh, will be at sub two on average uh, at the end of this year, and this is gonna progress down the slope. Where this will be a year from now, uh, I don't know exactly, but it, it's going to be quite, you know, significantly closer to zero. At this point, the battle will be somewhere else. It's the, so I, I take the y-axis and I uh, subtract the air length uh, latency, and then this, like, overhead latency and I attribute the overhead latency equally to each of the towers. You know the competitor's air path, you know the towers. Exactly. So I, I don't know the rest, but that's a way I can compare. And it's funny because like, you can see that the, uh, like, our competitors and ourselves are moving down the zero in essentially the same way. So the thing that will remain is the air length difference. So the intercept will remain. There's no moving away from that intercept. And, and the slope also remains. Thank you. <laughs> so now everyone's off the hook. All right, so, so this is the same graph on CME to NY4. I will, you know, given uh, the time, and I want to keep a bit of uh, time for the questions, I will not go. So let, let me do a little bit about crystal ball. What, what are the things that we talk about? You know, building over water, and it's not like walking over water, it's possible. So building over water, there are tons of things that people are discussing from balloons, uh, you know, flying balloons, tethered balloons, boats, you know, low earth orbiting satellites, Tons of those things. I don't know. I don't know. I, I'm pretty sure something's going to come out. And, and I forgot HF. So M Marconi come back. So the old Marconi experiment of 1900 something is coming back. And, and, and actually maybe in operation today, for all I know. Uh, so all of those are probable, I would say. N none of them is as wacky as it sounds. And given the amount of money going into building Hibernia and the amount of money that uh, is required to actually uh, have the best latency on Hibernia, you know, that kind of money induces you to do crazy things. And I do think a lot of people are trying to do crazy things. So my guess is that uh, something crazy is going to happen. Exactly when? Not sure. So the other uh, big trend, I would say, in the local build, in the short haul builds, is, is increasing the bandwidth. And increasing the bandwidth is, is really either like increasing the frequency of the carrier, which is going from E-band to W-band or to FSO, to optical, uh, or it is increasing the modulation. You know, there are, there are no two ways about it. There are no three ways about it. There are two ways about it. My, uh, 
my guess is that uh, increasing the modulation is going to come before increasing the bandwidth, uh, increasing the frequency of the carrier signal. Uh, now, the other big question is, where are the next builds? That's another, you know, and that's, that's the million dollar question. All the trading companies are kind of looking at each other and saying, who is built where? And, you know, is this link already built? And am I getting crushed there because someone else has it and I don't? So that, that's the thing where in some countries it's easy to get information because you can go to the filings. In other countries it's really hard because you don't have access to the filings. Uh, and there are countries where it makes it would be great to have like Australia does it's a super simple build maybe someone already has it uh, Korea it's probably very difficult maybe someone has it India I hear it's it's the regulation is is very difficult but it would be a great one uh, all of those markets are big question marks and I must say I don't have an answer for those. But I think a big trend, and that's another plug, sorry, uh, is going for shared services. And the shared services really are uh, services where people take the same data or go to the same data vendor. And, and everybody selling uh, feed handlers is said for the past how many years, I don't know, um, you know what, I can do something that normalizes all the exchanges in the world. And the trouble is that this is true, but to herd cats and, and traders really are cats, it's, it's really difficult. So while this proposition has always been true, it's always been difficult to herd the cats. And in some ways, we, we have a little bit of a window of opportunity. When I say we, at the time I mean we, McKay and Quincy, in that we have the fastest bandwidth available, so we can in some ways herd the cats. And we can actually get the cats to come home and consume the market data in a normalized way and presumably in a way that will lower the cost of the industry if we succeed in making adoption wider and wider than it is even today. So those are the next big thing. Now, what you should remember is that uh, it's not snake oil anymore. It's here to stay. It's here to stay and it's not as bad as it looked two years ago. And one of the effects that we had on the industry, and it's not we McKay this time, it's we the industry, is we've actually made the network guys and the programming guys work together. Before, you know, and, and maybe they actually did 20 years ago. Uh, so the old guys remember that there was some kind of discussion between the two kind of teams. But they got separated as bandwidth became assumed and big and plentiful, but it's not anymore. If you want the best bandwidth, it's not assumed and it's not uh, plentiful. So you have to be very careful about how you use it. And that means that the network and the application, uh, automated application code writers need to talk to each other. And it's very interesting, there's a, a you know, a rapprochement going on there. Now, the other thing was the big question we had before is, like, are your networks reliable? And the answer was obviously, well, no, they're not as reliable as fiber. But you know what? You need redundancy anyway, and redundancy is developed at the application level. So, it's just that you need to be a little bit more careful about it, but there's nothing fundamentally difficult about it. You just need to do it. And the last thing is it's a great field because there's a fierce and very healthy competition. So it's for the benefit of all the users. 
Yes. <laughs> what has the Pearson Health Account Commission done in crisis and what will it do in crisis? Oh, that's, that's such a bad question. <laughs> that's such a bad question. It hasn't moved prices at all. <laughs> we're, we're, we're not changing our prices at all. <laughs> uh, you know, can, can I not answer? <laughs> Uh, well, if you divide by the bandwidth, the multiplier is something that I would not admit in public. If you divide by usage, uh, and, and I would obviously need to define a stack, you know, uh, figure of merit for usage, it's, it's, it's not that bad because the markets are fairly simple beasts. You know, they, somehow they either go up or down. So you don't need to send a ton of data for that. And the relevant data is not that plentiful. So when, when you have to duplicate and, and store all the data, it's gigabits, it's, it's a pain. But when you actually trade on it, there's not a ton happening. So with 10 megabits, you're, you're actually fine. Or I believe so. You know, I'm not using it. So please, questions. More. How would the, how do you do the, what's your common carrier that you need to get confirms? How are you dealing with them as far as, you know, who's getting access, the blockchain, the blockchain process, and there's a penalty there, so, you know, someone always, you know, even on the common carrier, someone always beating someone else to that first, <laughs> So, it, you know, it's a great question. It, it's something that defines our company. We do many different deals on the financial side. If someone wants to commit for three years, he doesn't have the same price as committing to two years or, you know. But on the service side, we do no special deals, never, ever. And we do that because otherwise we can't serve our paranoid clients. Essentially, they're all paranoid. And, and, and you yeah, know, they, they rightly should be. Uh, but so what we have is we have a scheme where they, they, there's a number of packets they can send per second or per, you know, uh, 51.2 microsecond, actually, uh, if you do 10 uh, megabits. And whoever hits the switch first goes first, and that's it. And if you send more than one in, a, in, in your allotment period, the second one gets killed. So it, we, we do very simple things, but they ensure fairness. I don't think it's the standard outside of our little corner of the industry. I think it's kind of the standard in our very little corner of the world. In the other world, in the real world, in the normal world, if you will, people optimize other things. They optimize bandwidth, they optimize robustness, they you know, optimize price. Like we're optimizing latency and fairness. I think it's, it's incredibly good. Um, so the, the guy, I, I know the guy because uh, actually I, I'm French and I, so I speak French. Uh, and uh, he published a book called Six and we noticed the book on the web and it was available in binary format. We downloaded it and you know, it was a little game. One guy in the office cracked it in about five minutes and so I got to read it. So I ordered a few copies after that, but it was uh, obviously ciphered in French. So for non-French readers, it was more difficult. And the book was very good. You know, 
Obviously, he doesn't get everything right, but the guy is doing anthropology. You know, think of it. Like, and he's gone. It's, it's very funny because he's published things and he attracted attention. And since he attracted attention, he got a lot of people sending him emails and telling him things. So he got leads and like he's been able to unravel quite a few interesting snippets of our little corner of the world. It's a movie plot. Oh, it's, it's very good. So I, th I think some of the technical details are not accurate. Uh, but when he turns it into a book, if he goes to someone who knows technically exactly what's going on, it's going to be a great, great read. And the analysis, I would say, is better than Michael Lewis's. Yes. <laughs> you know, just, sorry, just to be on record. <laughs> well, thanks very much.